Well, good morning, Pat. Morning. How are you? I'm doing well, thank you. How are you? I am very well, thank you. Now, why don't we jump in with your um, giving us a bit of, of information about your background and also tell us about uh, the Bloomfield Hill Schools. Just give us a nutshell picture. Sure. So uh, I've been in, well, originally from Ann Arbor, Michigan. Uh, so if you're not familiar with Michigan, it's where the University of Michigan is. So I, I grew up in a college town, which was quite an amazing experience. And this is my 27th year in education. Uh, but for me, I knew I wanted to be an educator in eighth grade. Um, growing up with a single mom and having two siblings, uh, eighth grade for me was a very, very difficult time. And I could have gone one or two ways, you know, made some very poor decisions, even as young as an eighth grader, or made some good decisions. And I was very fortunate to be in Ann Arbor Public Schools and have teachers that looked out for me almost like they were my parents. Uh, that did things that you wouldn't expect teachers to do. And I knew at that point in eighth grade that when I grow up, I want to be an educator. I want to have the opportunity to give back and make a difference in someone's life, like those educators have made for me. Um, two of them I'm still friends with to this day. Mm -hmm. uh, they're well in retirement. I contact them once a year just to say hi and see how they're doing and let them know how I'm doing and remind them that I'm where I'm at, a uh, large part because of them. Uh, during my 27 year journey in education, I was a long time teacher. I was a department head. I've been an athletic director, an assistant principal, principal, and now of course as a superintendent. So a little bit of everything. I even coached for over 20 years, even coached as an administrator, which was quite the experience as a principal you know, by day you're running the building and then shortly after school working with the, <laughs> the freshman girls basketball program, you know, what do we call you? Like, does the code <laughs> of conduct still apply in practice? But if I say something I should, it's like, you know, it's a different setting to know me and I, I get being nervous. It's kind of awkward. Like, you know, you show up to the games like, who's your coach? Well, our principal coaches our team. Uh, <laughs> a little different there. Um, so I've been in Bloomfield Hills now for about a year and a half. Um, well, 15, 16 months. Uh, so you mean as the superintendent? Yes, as the superintendent. Uh, we have 5,500 students, uh, high achieving school district, high graduation rate. Uh, the parents are incredibly involved and incredibly supportive, uh, which is just a great thing. Um, work with seven great members of the school board that are all passionate about educating and finding ways to remove barriers so all the kids get what they need. Uh, which is exciting as well. Also had the honor of teaching curriculum and instruction at the graduate level for a little while and working with those future teachers or teachers that are currently in practice. Uh, and that was a great experience. So that's a little bit uh, about me and my background in a nutshell. Well, education has been a passion for you since a very young age, which is... Uh... I should have been so lucky as to know what I was going to do in the eighth grade. It took me a lot longer. So you're very fortunate in that sense. Well, our subject today, as you know, is the transition and a pretty dramatic transition you've made from building principal to superintendent. You've taken the helm at a very distinguished, nationally known school district. Uh, what would make your list of the major differences uh, between being a building principal and now at the helm of a whole district as its chief executive officer? Right, so you're right. It's a little bit of a jump, right? Going from a building principal to the superintendentship and uh, there definitely have been some differences. One of the major differences is who you're accountable to, right? So as a building principal, I've got my, you know, my own little like island and the things that are going on and the kind of report and work with central office and that's the main focus. Whereas as a superintendent, I'm really working with seven board members and my responsibility and scope is much larger. Uh, communicating to a wider group of stakeholders, 
coming from the high school principalship, I focus on the high school parents. That was the group that I needed to over communicate to. Of course, as a superintendent looking at how is it going to look pre-K all the way through age 26? How am I going to communicate so every group feels included? Um, also, one of the biggest differences is in the conversations I have with building administrators. So when I was a high school principal, I might hear from an elementary principal who'd reach out and share what's going on. We'd have a short conversation and then they would go back to it. I remember after a couple of weeks here, there was an administrator that worked out to me, uh, reached out to me about a circumstance going on. And we had a great conversation. It's like, yeah, wow, okay. And then he said to me, so what are you going to do? I said, <laughs> it was, well, yeah, we have, we have to make a decision because it's going to impact other schools as well. So I want to know how you want me to move forward. And that was, you know, it really hit me like, okay, mm -hmm. I, I'm responsible for everything. It's no longer just a conversation <laughs> with a colleague who wants advice. I now need to make that decision. And then making sure that I went back and got the voices of, well, this is going to impact all the way down the preschool, the middle school. So let me start with the preschool director. Let me work my way up and get input from everyone before we come to the table to make a decision. Um, another big difference is how serious uh, board governance is and how committed mm. you have to be working with a uh, close relationship with the board. It really is relationship. Uh, it's a relationship you have to invest time in, nurture in. As a building principal, I had a great relationship with the uh, Board of Education, uh, but we only spoke so often. Now, as a superintendent, you know, one of the big shifts is how often we speak. And I speak to different board members uh, via email or text or a phone call pretty much daily with different ones about different things. And so just nurturing that relationship. But it's, it's no different than what you do in life. If you want a good relationship, the only way to do it is one conversation at a time. And so I've realized I'm spending more time as a superintendent doing that than you would obviously as a, a building principal. Um, some of the day-to-day -day duties have shifted, you know, going from the building principal where you're putting out fires nonstop, more so to putting out fires occasionally. And that's been a big shift. And um, let's see what else. I would say the students. You know, I was very active in the building as a building principal. And so every day I saw tons of students, interacted with tons of students, had, you know, multiple conversations. Um, I'm very fortunate here in Bloomfield Hills that my board understands the need for me to be in buildings. So here I'm in buildings every week and I'm talking to students, but it's not the same as it was before. Mm -hmm. So not having those daily interactions continually uh, has been a big change as well. Um, but again, I, I'm still fortunate that um, I'm able to get out every week in the building to talk to students, talk to staff. So these are just a few of the differences I've noticed early on in the role and the change. So what have you found most challenging about this transition? And uh, I might add uh, stressful about the transition. Maybe there's a little bit of overlap with the other question, but let's um, focus on the challenge. So coming in as a new superintendent, I made sure I had a really good mentor group. So I had about seven or eight, either current or retired superintendents that were working with me and mentoring. So I felt confident. I felt I was ready up to the challenge, ready to go. And then COVID hit. So <laughs> 59 days. 59, mind you, counting weekends, schools closed. So immediately I reached out to my network and said, hey, schools are closed. What do I do? What's going on? And their response to me was, we've never done this before. We have no idea. What are you doing? <laughs> I'm thinking, well, I've done this for 59 days. So let me check. I don't know. <laughs> right? That's why I'm calling you. You, you know, one superintendent <laughs> had served uh, who was retired was a superintendent for 26 years. I said, you know, this is you, you are the king. You know everything. <laughs> and his response was, I have no clue what to do, where you should go or where to start. And you know, that, that kind of hit me. And so that was probably one of the most challenging things. Um, I, I think what really, that really benefited me was, reading a lot of articles at that point. 
And I found out that some schools in other countries were already ahead of us with COVID and looking to go back and making plans. So I, I was very fortunate after reaching out to some schools in Canada, uh, in Israel, South Korea, Denmark, and Japan, that they were willing to form a consortium with us and some other schools in the United States. And so that was really, really interesting. So I went from being the newbie to kind of leading this international consortium of getting kids back in school as safe as possible. And one story that really stood out to me, we were working with an IB school in Copenhagen, Denmark. And they said, well, we divide it up. So there's a teacher in a room with a few students and they have a camera and there are teachers in the other, or students in the other room. So it was like 10 in one room, 10, 10. And my question was, well, okay, you got the teacher in one room, but you got students in another, and they're older students. I said, well, who's supervising the students? And the administrator said, well, no one. I said, okay, I, I don't understand. You've got a teacher in a room with a camera, kids can see the teacher. Yes. You have two other rooms where they're watching on the screen, but there's no adult supervising. Yes. I said, well, how do you know they're doing what they're supposed to do? And the response was, it's easy. This is Denmark. We just tell the students and then they do it. <laughs> I, was, I was like, wow. I, I guess I missed that class in grad school where everyone <laughs> follows whatever you ask them to do, um, which is great. And then as far as, you know, most challenging, you also don't know what you don't know. And so I've had a lot of aha moments where, you know, something comes across and I, I reach out to, you know, the assistant superintendents and routes say, can you give me a little background about this? And well, you know, there's, there's a 20 year story to what happened and this is how we landed up here. So just a lot of those aha moments. Mm. Um, but one thing that's really important is just having a team in teamwork. And I've been very fortunate here that everyone's really worked together as a team. And I think, you know, you know, there are very few benefits of COVID, but I think COVID allowed me quickly to get to know the people on my team and what their strengths were and, you know, where they were best placed and where I could leverage them to make sure our students and staff were successful. And so that would be, you know, one of the good things I would say that has come out of COVID. And we've all become experts in video conferencing, video meetings, uh, virtual education. Right. So at least we've gained important expertise in the midst of all this crisis. Uh, no, it will stay too, right? A lot of things will stay. So I, I think of like you mentioned the video conference. I attended one of the high school PTO meetings where there were almost 100 people in attendance. You would never get that if people had to come in person. So I think some of the video conferencing and some of the things that we've learned will be part of a new normal. I think that's an excitement for a lot of us that we're not going to go back to do things how they used to be done, that there's a new path forward, a path forward that incorporates more student choice and voice and kind of meets everyone where they're at. And so I think that's going to be, as we come out of the pandemic, exciting to see how we leverage all the new things we've learned. Now, looking back, What do you wish you'd been better prepared to handle when you, uh, as a new superintendent, taking the helm at the Bloomfield Hill Schools? I wish I knew more about board governance, right? So um, I'll go all the way back to my, my undergrad time. So undergrad, <clears throat> went to college, read all the books. I was ready to teach. I got in my first classroom. I was so excited. And, you know, we're getting to know each other. And about two weeks in, I noticed that I was trying to teach and, and the students were really talking. And, you know, I'm like, okay, what do I do? So I thought about my time in undergrad. And I looked at how the class and had that serious face. And I said, uh, excuse me, can I have your attention, please? And then there was silence. And then everyone looked up. And then everyone went back to talking. And I was like, wait a minute. In the book, it says this is exactly how things go. And then when it didn't happen, I was kind of thrown off for a little bit. And I think of governance the same way. You know, in grad school, I learned all about board governance and one plus one equals two. And here's how it's going to be. And here's how it moves forward. 
And that's not necessarily how it always works. You know, there's multiple different types of governance models. You know, I was familiar with probably, I would say one, one and a half models, but there's so many different models based on maybe the needs of the team and how it can operate and what would best serve the different personalities you have on the team. So even though I, I took the class and I did well, and I had uh, quite a bit of experience working with the board as a building principal, I, I really wish I knew more about governance and the overall operation of board governance. And again, all the different options that are out there, um, just because you have one model doesn't mean it's the best model for the group you're working with. There might be a better model that helps the team function at an even higher level then that just benefits the staff and students. I mean, really at the end of the day, although I report to the board and I'm the board's employee, I feel I work for the students. That's who I'm ultimately responsible to, are the students I serve. And so if I can find a different model or a model that better serves the needs of a team of eight to move the district forward, um, that's something I feel I need to des definitely look at. So that's one area that I wish I had a little more knowledge about coming into it. Well, certainly easier said than done. You and I have discussed the fact that governance is not a fully developed or full-fledged field. There, there is a tremendous amount of debate about best practices, uh, the principles that should guide us in the area of governance and and so on. So uh, it's a huge challenge to hit the ground running as a new superintendent, at least in the governance arena, as you've right. learned. Well, also thinking back, what lessons have you learned from your experience as a superintendent about uh, leadership. Uh, what new um, uh, ways of doing things and so on have, have you learned? I wouldn't say not necessarily a new thing, but just a, a very firm reminder uh, that a lot of times you need to go slow to go fast, uh, that it's really important. You need to look long term, um, understanding that things can't all be done. You know, you can't have 18 initiatives right away. Uh, you would love to. I kind of compare it to buying when I bought my first house, right? So I'm young. I'm in my early 20s. My wife and I pick out our first house. We know there's some things that maybe need a little updating. We want to change. But you can't go in and say, all right, we're going to redo the bathroom. We're going to redo the kitchen. We're going to redo the carpet. We're going to fix the landscaping. We're going to do the siding. We're going to put new side in. We're going to plant new trees. We're going to finish the basement. We're Right? You, you can't do it all at once, right? You have to be systematic, have a process, have a plan. That's not something new I learned, but really looking at it as a superintendent through the lens of a whole, whole organization, the importance of putting the right pieces in the right spot. And also the importance of making sure you've included all the stakeholders and you're bringing everyone with you. Because if you're a leader and you turn around and there's no one behind you, you're not leading. You know, one of the things when we went to remote learning in March of 2020, had a lot of teachers reach out to me um, saying, you know, some frustration about, we really need to look at this from a high school point of view. We really need to look at it from a middle school point of view. We need to look at it from a K-1 point of view. We need to look at it from a 3-4, a K-5. And so, you know, from a special ed point of view, from an electives and specials point of view. So one of the things I put together was a school, um, a teacher task force for all of our teachers. And so I got representatives from different buildings, different grade levels, uh, different content areas to really make sure, and we met once a week about what's working, what's not working, what adjustments can we make? And then from that group, we then shared out with the rest of the teachers, here are the adjustments that we're going to make based on what we're hearing the feedback we're getting. And seeing how well that went over and just the idea of collaboration and the teachers having a voice and the importance of, again, bringing everyone with you. Not something new I learned, but it was really just 
a quick reminder. Like I said, if you want to, you got to go slow to go fast. And I think that's been really, really important and, and a great reminder for me, honestly. And it's not just going slow to go fast. It's bringing along a diverse group of stakeholders and employees and board Absolutely. members and so on with you in, right. in that process. Yeah, so the teacher group was one part. We had a whole different task force of different stakeholders, which included community members, retired people from the community, parents, board members uh, from a, a different point of view. So it really was that the effort of collaboration, uh, which is someone that was, you know, a, as a former coach, that whole idea of a team. You go together as a team. This really resonated with me. Again, nothing new, but just really a reminder. Mm -hmm. And it was also nice to see that a lot of things that I had learned prior to my career definitely translate into the superintendency role and served me really well. Final question, Pat. I know you have far more important things to do than our chatting. So I'll let you get to your day fairly soon. But let's say that you're sitting with three or four um, soon to be superintendents. They're about to take the helm in a district. What will your advice, would your advice be for them? So number one thing, learn as much as you can. Um, I sat down 20 years ago with my, my superintendent at the time, and I shared with them that I want to be a superintendent. That is my ultimate career goal. And we kind of laid out a plan, and he laid out a timeline. And I said, that timeline is too fast. I want to enjoy each step of the way. You know, I taught for 16 years before I went into administration. Mm. I said, I'm not looking to go like this and make a huge jump. I go, I want to go slow and steady. And his advice to me was, we need to build your capacity. And that would be my advice, that if you're looking to be in that role, you need to build your capacity. And so we worked out a plan for me that between finance, HR, curriculum and instruction, that I would be able to step outside of my current role and actively participate in all these different things. So sitting on, you know, bargaining teams, sitting on the team through K through 12 alignment, sitting on the finance committee and being able to sit in on meetings, all the things that quote unquote typically wouldn't be the role of a teacher, of an assistant principal, of a principal I was able to do. And so coming to this role, you know, for example, in HR, well, bargaining is coming up. We're bargaining all the contracts. Well, great. I, I, I've been in, you know, contract negotiations with every group. I've been IBB trained. I've worked with, you know, the union leadership for, you know, close to 20 years on contract planning and negotiation. So having that familiarity, having a familiarity with the budget and, you know, from a regular budget to zero-based budgeting and having that experience that really, really pays dividends. I think it's difficult if you just try to maintain your current role and don't expand and don't look outside that there's the learning curve is going to be incredibly higher and it's already high making the jump as it is. You don't need to make it any more difficult, but doing that. And the other thing is relationships are the key. If you're going to be successful in anything alone, it all comes down to relationships, in my opinion. And I feel strongly that the only way to build those relationships are one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, I know when I got the job as superintendent here in Bloomfield Hills, one of the first things I did is I sat down with every employee in central office, one-on-one, -on -one, just to get to know them. I didn't leave the conversation. I let them leave the conversation. They shared out whatever they wanted. Some of the meetings were 20 minutes. Some were well over an hour. And, you know, that I feel is really important if you're going into this role. Um, meeting in groups just won't do it. Uh, people want to know you care. And they want to know you care about them more so as a person than as an employee. 
And by meeting one-on-one, -on -one, you really show them that you are only there to focus on them and nothing else. Especially if you listen, right? As well, opposed listening. to lecturing and preaching, you actually listen. Right. You have to be an active listener. And that's why I let them lead the conversation. You know, I'm here to learn about you. Feel free to share anything you want. And so often it's nature like, oh, yeah, my kids do that. Oh, yeah, I did. That's not the goal, right? We have to understand it's not about us at that moment. It's about them and getting to know them. And I learned so many valuable things. And I was able to make small changes within my first month here where people said, wow, this is a great change. And it showed them not only was I listening, but I did something about it. I fixed something that for many what may have seemed minor to others was a major uh, concern of theirs. And, and an, easy, an easy fix, right? Like something very minute that I was able to change. And I know people follow up with me saying, appreciate the meeting. I am more appreciative that you not only listen, but you took care of something for many of us that was a thorn in our side. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Hmm. Well, Pat, I have thoroughly enjoyed our time together and I uh, found it fascinating uh, to hear about your dramatic transition from building principal to right. superintendent. I'm sure our viewers will find the story very fascinating. I wanna thank you for your time. I know you're terribly busy. I wish you a safe and satisfying day. You take care. Thank you. Thank you. you too. Thanks, Doc, appreciate it, thank you.